I'm going to start with a survey. How many of you consider yourselves analytical people? Raise your hands. OK. How many of you consider yourselves creative people? Raise your hands. I, I'm impressed. That's good. That's good. Now, how many consider yourselves both or think that's a stupid question to begin with? Oh, wow. OK, good. Uh, no, no, put them back down again. I was a little bit worried because I thought maybe there was no point to my talk. But actually, this is, this is working out well. OK. Uh, I ask that question because it comes up a lot in the work that I do. And I work at CERN, as you heard in the introduction. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I work in this area that you see in the picture. This is the inner detector of the ATLAS experiment on the Large Hadron Collider. And it's complicated. But what you need to know is that I work on something called the pixel detector. And this is effectively the world's most complex digital camera. It takes 80 megapixel photos, 40 million times every second. And I've been working on this for about the past 17 years. And <clears throat> during that time, I started to get interested in other types of cameras, actually. So in fact, I went and I did a master in film directing. And I came back. I actually didn't, never left CERN, but I, I took a, a, a period to concentrate a little bit on filmmaking. And I came back and I founded, with some other colleagues, something called the Cineglobe Film Festival, which you may have heard of. You may just know it as the film festival that's at CERN. And we receive films from over 100 countries around the world. And they're all inspired by science or technology in some way. And what we try to do is to show the links between science and technology and society. And I also got interested in the broader implications of all of this artistic practice. And I started working with the Arts at CERN program and was the scientific inspiration partner. That's a big sounding term. Uh, basically, the scientific partner of Jan Peters, the filmmaker in residence, that stayed with us for the better part of a year, actually, working with our team underground in the cavern, day to day, watching what we did, asking questions, feeding back, and documenting the whole thing, obviously, as part of his artistic practice. And so with these two different pursuits that I do, I get a lot of questions. And it used to be very simple. People would say, well, how do you, how do you manage to do all of that? And so the first way I interpreted that question was very literally. I said, well, yeah, it's true. I, I, I work really late and you know, on the weekends and stuff like that. And my wife is often not very happy because I'm away a lot. And they said, no, no, no. How do you do two things that are complete opposites? And I realized. That idea of them being complete opposites, that actually comes from something that has been very current in our kind of consciousness for the last several decades, excuse me, decades, which is this idea of left brain, right brain separation, right? That there's an analytical side to your brain, and if you follow <laughs> the, the drawing literally, this artist clearly thinks that that means lots of numbers and lots of graphs and shapes and stuff like that, and if you're creative, you're right-brained, then apparently you spill lots of paint on the table or something like that. Um, but you're creative. And the problem with this distinction between right brain and left brain, I was worried I would get that wrong, uh, right brain and left brain, is that it creates this idea of identity, actually. And so we don't think of those as qualities. We tend to think of them more as who we are. So you might think, if I'm brainy or intelligent or I like numbers, I'm analytical and I think with this, I, I use this as my primary way of interacting with the world. And if you're really creative and impulsive and you like to make stuff and things like that, you might think I, I use my gut or my heart or my, my feelings, I'm not, I, I'm not cerebral, you know, you might hear people say that. Again, these are very much identities and the problem with identities is that they're essentially categories, right? They put us in boxes, and then we get the idea that if we're in one box, that it may be difficult to communicate with people in the other box, OK? And so this, this concept, essentially, of right brain, left brain, it's actually created this kind of society 
I like to say, that's divided into two halves. I mean, okay, it's not quite that simple, obviously. There's more uh, characteristics to people than just these two broad sort of categories. But, you know, broadly speaking, people kind of see themselves on one side or the other, right? And they're really, they're inversions of each other, okay? And this is something that has transferred into the understanding of art and science, being art is one thing, science is another, and they don't cross. And maybe if they do, it's only within certain extraordinary people, actually. It's not something that's kind of in all of us, okay, to one degree or another. So this idea of left brain, right brain, is always something that it kind of uh, didn't sit well with me, and I think a lot of people felt that way. You know, it's, it kind of sounds overly limiting, this idea that there might be a physical block to actually uh, using our entire capacity uh, to both reason and create. And this is one really, really nice instance of where science actually backs up something that kind of feels like it's right. Because actually this is wrong, okay? The left brain, right brain idea isn't real, right? All of the research of the last 10 or so years, and even maybe before that, actually says that we use our entire brain, okay, for everything we do. And especially if we want to be creative, if we want to invent, then we need to have access to both analysis of what exists, bring in everything from outside, see what it is, figure out how it fits together, and then, genes and then that creates the genesis of new ideas, okay? And so we use all of the areas of the brain to process this. So what that really means is that we have actually a society okay, that actually is composed of people that all have varying degrees of ability. I'm not trying to say that everybody is as creative as everybody else. That's certainly not the case. And it's also not the case that everybody is as analytical as everybody else. So when somebody says, I'm not good with numbers, that may be true, okay? It might not mean that they couldn't be good with numbers, but I can tell you one thing. If they believe that they're not good with numbers because that side of their brain doesn't work, then they are never going to be good with numbers. And likewise, if somebody believes the opposite about creativity, they are never gonna be creative if they don't believe that that side of their brain works, okay? And so, when we talk about doing collaborations between arts and science, it's important to note that the purpose is not to make one serve the other. We don't bring people who practice the arts into a place like CERN so they can make pretty pictures. This is a pretty picture, but this is not art. This is actually an event display, okay, of a, of a real collision at Atlas. And this is something we use to communicate. It's not something that we use for artistic expression. And that's not why we bring artists in. They don't create this. We have professionals at CERN, at other experiments, that all are very, very qualified at interpreting the data and turning it into things that people understand and they can communicate. We bring artists in actually to have a dialogue, to talk about practice, and they may make beautiful things, but the making of the things is not the purpose, okay? It's not the artworks that are important in these collaborations. It's the examination of the artistic practice and the examination of the scientific practice and how they intersect that's actually really important for us. And so what we're effectively doing is training this lens of artistic practice on the scientific practice we do. And what does that do? It gives meaning, okay? It helps us define what it means to do the work that we do. It's not always easy to capture that, but this is really, really important. Because in something like particle physics, actually, meaning is a big, big question. We are asking some questions that are so fundamental and so kind of earth-shattering that to just look at it from the numbers doesn't really do it justice. So you might ask artistically, for example, how will it all end? Well, we can ask scientifically, is the universe expanding and will it ever stop? And putting these two together makes the question more meaningful for everybody on both sides. Likewise, where do we come from? The origin question. Well, that's simply, how did matter form? And then, likewise, are we alone in the universe? This is probably the one that maybe troubles people the most, actually. 
And then, actually, unfortunately, the scientific <laughs> examination of that is maybe even more disconcerting. Is our universe the only one, or do we live in one of a multitude of multiverses? That, that, that's pretty scary, actually, so we won't go down that road. <laughs> but, um, but this is clearly ripe for scientific as well as artistic exploration. And, of course, there's always the question that many artists have asked, is there a god? And the scientific interpretation of that would be, probably, is there a god, actually? <laughs> because some questions are universal, right? And that's really what I'm getting at here, is that we're asking essentially about the same things. We're just putting them together in slightly different ways. And so when we take this lens of artistic practice and we look at our scientific practice, we come up with actually some really, really interesting things. This is a pinhole camera photo done by Jan Peters of the Atlas experiment. And this photo, this is an analog photo on a piece of photo paper. I inverted it so it looks like a real picture. Uh, this is a photo that took between 24 and 48 hours to take. So this is like the world's slowest analog photo of the world's fastest digital camera. That's kind of cool, right? I mean, I don't know, really know why exactly, but it is. And then likewise, if we turn that on its head a little bit, what we have is this. This is by Semiconductor, a, uh, a, a duo, a, a couple actually, that's been started working at the Aegis experiment. And um, this is traces of antimatter through photographic emulsion that has been digitally animated. So in this case, the sensing medium of the scientific experiment is actually analog. And the reason is because the digital sensors that we can create are not accurate enough. So they had to go back to photographic emulsion. And then the artists, through digital practice, have taken this and made it into something animated and with life. And again, I don't really know exactly what these things mean but I know that they make me feel differently about the way that I practice science and the engineering that it takes to get that science done. And actually, it just so happens that some things in science and engineering kind of follow some general rules that fit also in artistic practice. Like, things that look ugly and inelegant probably aren't done properly. And when they are, you can kind of tell. This is something that is vitally important, actually, not only to theoretical physicists, but also to engineers, even to auto mechanics. I mean, to people doing anything that requires creativity and analysis. Some of this element of intuition is critical. <laughs> and of course, we all need to express ourselves, right? This is an impromptu sketch, obviously, that was done on some of the cabling in Atlas. You can find this on Google Street View, actually, in fact. Um, but the, the serious point here is that it's, it's not the artwork. This doesn't matter, but what made it happen is what matters. And so I leave you, actually, with this idea. The combination of arts and science is not for corporate brainstorming sessions. It's not to make us create better widgets. It's not to get to the bottom line, okay? It's to ask fundamental questions. And this was captured beautifully by one of my favorite theoretical physicists, Savas Demopoulos, when he was interviewed for the film Particle Fever. And he said, why do we do science? Why do we do art? The things that are the least important for our survival are the very things that make us human. Thank you.